Hello, everyone. It is Jamie Jill right here with another episode of Mad Lit Musings, where we chat with authors about faith and fiction and nonfiction, and we go into the deep questions of story and faith. Uh, today, I have with me Valerie Frazier Lessie, and um, she is a author, fellow author at Baker Publishing House, um, where my books are published as well. And she has a book out called Letters from My Sister. So welcome, Valerie, to Mad Lit Musings. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yes. Oh, and now my... One moment. I had a... Technical a... problems. Yeah, we'll edit that out. I had a YouTube <laughs> video on a different browser that was open and my book fell on my keyboard and it started playing. <laughs> So I was hearing this like whoa and I was doing research on ghosts for my books and I was like oh, wow. there's all of a sudden I hear this there's this ghost child and she's walking down the, I'm like <laughs> you should have you ever heard of a book called 13 Alabama ghosts no everybody reads it in like middle school it's um Catherine Tucker Wyndham okay. is the author and it's all these ghost stories from Alabama. So <laughs> yeah, it. of course when you're of course when you're a young teenager it's Oh yeah, exactly. Ah, oh, that's awesome. I used to go, oh this is I'll edit all this out, but my family used to go to Lake Superior when I was a kid and we get this cabin that was literally on the shore. So I would sleep on the front porch in a hammock and you'd have the waves and everything. And oh, awesome. they always had a ghost book of ghosts of Lake Superior on the coffee table. So I would get myself deliciously terrified. <laughs> and then go outside. And, and then go outside and sleep with the waves <laughs> crashing. And there's like no locks on the screen porch. So you're sure that you're going to be completely <laughs> strangled by a ghost in the middle of the night. It's, it was the best, the best. <laughs> All right. So take two. All right. So um, we have your book that's coming out, which is Letters from My Sister. And um, I'll just read a little bit off the back cover. Two sisters, one single event, a family changed forever. At the turn of the century, sisters Emily and Callie Bullock are living a privileged life as the only daughters of a wealthy Alabama cotton farmer when their well-ordered household gets turned upside down by the arrival of Lily McGee. Arrestingly beautiful Lily quickly and innocently draws the wrong kind of attention. Meanwhile, Callie meets a man who offers her the freedom to abandon social constraints and discover her truest self. After Lily has a baby, Callie witnesses something she was never meant to see, or did she? Her memory is a haze, just an image in her mind of Emmy standing on a darkened riverbank and cradling Lily's ba missing baby girl. Only when the sisters are separated, does the truth slowly come to light through their letters, including a revelation that will shape the rest of Callie's life? That sounds like delicious and <laughs> mysterious. And I know that you're probably not going to put all the ghostly, dark, gothic-y spins on it that I always like to do with mine. But that I sounds that. it sounds like kind of that Southern, a little bit of Southern darkness there. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. You know, there's this... Um, <laughs> singer songwriter that I love by the name of Kate Campbell and she calls it Southern Noir <laughs> she said oh. it's this thing where you can be in a place in the south and it can be a bright sunny day with a blue sky but you can still sense in certain places something mm -hmm. an undercurrent okay and um I remember feeling that at Dockery Farms which is on the Blues Trail in the Mississippi Delta and I feel it a lot outside and more outside than what you might expect in an old house yeah. or something like an old home place or something. So there is some of that going on. I think. I like uh, that. I like so. that. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, I just read the back co cover obviously, but tell us a little bit about where the story came from, what inspired you and just let's, let's launch into the story. All righty. All righty. Well, a lot of this is really inspired by my grandmother's family, and she uh, she had one sister, my great aunt Effie. My grandmother's name was Icy Lee, and um, they were the the lone sisters growing up in this house full of brothers. And their father was a a successful cotton planter um, or farmer, really. I mean, it, people you say planter, and people you know picture oh, right. 
millions of acres and it wasn't like that, but he was right, just a, right. a good, successful cotton farmer. And, um, and they were very different. Like my Aunt Effie was, um, she died before I was born, but she was reportedly very feminine, whatever that means, very ladylike. Uh, she taught school. She was a regular churchgoer, very devout. Uh, my grandmother was bored with women. She wanted to be talking farming. She wanted to know what the men were doing in the fields. Uh, her father was a hero. She liked to I love be it. around livestock, you know. So they were they were opposites. And yet, right before my grandmother um, died, she was in her 90s when she died. My mother asked her if she had any regrets. And she said, well, I wish I'd been more like Effie, which Aww. was kind of funny because... And she named my mother after. My mother's name is Effie Nanette. Um, and she, got, she goes by Nanette, but Effie is her first name. And my grandmother is just not the kind of person who would model herself after anybody. She was, I mean, her nickname in our family was the Colonel. That should tell you something. Oh, oh. I, strong I, woman there. I love it. Yeah. Strong Southern woman. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's brother came home from World War II and he said she was bossier than any sergeant he encountered in the United <laughs> States Army. So he called her the Colonel. And it kind of stuck. Um, but anyway, just the idea that she admired anybody enough to want to be like them was kind of surprising to us. And then the the letters kind of came from some postcards that I found in a cabinet in her bedroom. And they were between uh, my grandmother and her sister when uh, Aunt Effie was at the University of Alabama for a summer teaching program. And there was a lightness to them and a, I don't know, just a sense of fun in their exchanges mm -hmm. to each other that surprised me because my grandmother was very serious, you know, okay. uh, don't get too happy because the worst is, is just around the corner. You know, that was my grandmother. <laughs> prepare, prepare. So, yeah, prepare for the worst. <laughs> so, um, so just that element of her personality. And I started picturing these two sisters on a cotton farm with all these brothers and, you know, what life might be like for them. So that's where part of the relationships came from. And the other big part of it was that there was a woman named, a black woman named Bama McCoy, who ran my great grandparents' home. I mean, she ran the house. Mm -hmm. um, she cooked, she did everything. And she's one of the few people that my grandmother truly revered and respected. Um, I think my mother told me that her oldest brother was born in a hospital and she said the rest of them, mother and Bama handled. So Bama was a midwife and she delivered all these children. And um, when she died, my grandmother had my cousin drive her to the home where and okay. it was a tradition in the South where you'd, mm -hmm. you know, bring the deceased back home and everybody yep. would go specs. And um, I think it was Mother's Day weekend and my grandmother took a corsage and, and put it on Bama. So she loved her mm -hmm. all of them. And so um, at a time when those relationships were not the norm, mm -hmm. when you tend to think of more distance between black and white, more conflict between black Southerners and white Southerners, um, it was absolutely possible for those lines to be crossed. Mm -hmm. And that things get interesting, you know, is mm -hmm. where the moments where the personal and the heartfelt really jumps over those societal barriers and yeah or whatever and my grandmother wasn't one to follow anybody's rules anyway um but just that she was genuinely close to this woman and respected her so much so those that's where it all started with those okay. relationships I love it I love it and I love the element of your own family kind of interwoven through the story, obviously fictionalized, um, but that inspiration coming from, from real life is always encouraging because then when you read stories like this um, about crossing, you know, racial lines or just sisters that are, can be completely different, um, it's always encouraging to see those stories come out and the joy and the hope that can come from those relationships. Yeah, right. And th th that's part of the character of, of Lily, who in the story, she's the granddaughter of um, Hepzibah Jordan, who was okay. kind of modeled after this uh, woman who kept house for my great grandparents. And uh, Lily kind of shakes things up because she is described as being, you know, of course, the terminology back then, they would say colored, which we would not say now, but those characters right, right. did. So mm -hmm. she was not black. She was not white. 
she was as uh Callie Caesar just occupying this space somewhere in between mm -hmm. and I don't really address that too much because I didn't want to get caught up in that I just wanted that she's in the middle and she's beautiful mm -hmm. and and that is something that sort of troubles some of the white women in the community and Callie recognizes that and she says you know she makes it very hard for them to believe they're better than her you know yeah. because she's very beautiful and very talented she's a singer and mm -hmm. so uh, Callie sees the jealousy of these who are really gossiping about Lily and yeah. her because they're jealous of her. And Callie sees that right away. Callie is, you know, the protagonist and she's like, they're just, you know, she's just upset their apple cart because mm -hmm. they believe what they've always believed if they look at her and listen to her sing. So um, I like those things that kind of flip you know, the normal way yeah. of the community. And really, I I tend to say community instead of society because most of, their, well, they're small town or the rural South for the most part. And those tend to be their own little worlds. You know, yeah. a small is its own little world, probably small town anywhere. And everybody knows everybody and everybody knows what the rules are. You right. know, right. everybody knows who the good people are and who the bad people are, you know, and yep. you, you, know, yep. you know, and I remember when I was about to graduate high school and I wanted to go to Auburn University instead of a smaller university nearby and everybody would say, well, why do you want to go to such a big school? And I was like, because I'm so tired of going to a school, my high school, where not only do we all know each other, our parents all knew each other, our yep. parents even knew each other. And so I feel like I have this expectation of me, you yeah. know. Yeah. Still. So I wanted to get away from that. And I, but so sometimes it's good and sometimes it's, it can be suffocating, you know, just this, <laughs> oh, we know who your parents are. So we know what you're like, you know. Right, right. And everybody yeah. knows when the lines are crossed or rules are broken. Yeah. I was actually yeah. doing some research in some old newspapers and um, I was really shocked that they were almost the, I think you know, they were almost like rag papers back in the day, but it was their yeah. actual, their actual town newspaper. It, it wasn't meant to be a tabloid. And yet it read like that. It was like, Lucy May was seen leaving <laughs> Charles Beacon's house at 8 p.m. after dark. Like, and they would report it like it was right. news. And I'm like, what? That's crazy. Yeah, it's it's amazing, you know, yeah. just, just to think of, you know, the the roles of of women, you know, through and I think there's always been free thinking women in every generation, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and and Callie is is certainly that um, there's another really, to me, fascinating character in the book. Her name is Terza and she is Hepzibah's mother and Terza is a seer. She is a former she was formerly enslaved. She was freed in Alabama and stayed in Alabama and became a landowner and bought her, brought all of her family together and sees herself. Uh, she tells Callie that, that God made her a deliverer. Mm. She gets to deliver hope. She said, every new child brings hope that things mm. will be better. And so she said, God blessed her with the family and uh, made her a deliverer of hope. And, uh, and so Terza, is just very insightful and she tells Callie you know your sister she has the tender heart but you have the questioning heart mm -hmm. and that's going to cause you pain but the truth will set you free but your yeah. freedom is going to come at a price right you know yeah. yeah yeah because Callie just won't accept things the way they are and she wants to understand you know why these relationships are what they are so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so yeah I love that. I love that. I love relationships in books. I mean, and I think it's because they, they really do parallel real life, you know, <laughs> and, and we read yeah. them as fiction. And yet I think inside all of us are going, Ooh, that's a sting or Ooh, yes. That's the joy. Like, yeah. yes, I've been there, done that, seen that, felt that. <laughs> I'm so much more interested in the, the inner life of characters and their relationships with each other, which, mm -hmm. you know, for some reason, readers expect something to happen. I don't know what's going on with them, but they want a plot, you know? I guess. So, yeah, it's like, what? You want something to happen? 
and the very first book that I did, which was called Missing Isaac, my dad read an early draft and he said, oh, it's real good. Don't nothing much happen on page 35, though, does it? <laughs> and so I had done everything. I was so scared of writing dialogue that everything was reflection. Everything oh. was the same character. He was <laughs> reflecting for 35 pages. And so I finally decided, you know, they have to talk. Mm -hmm. And I was so afraid of writing bad dialogue that I just wouldn't write any. And I, since I got over that fear, it's my very favorite thing to do. Dialogue is dialogue. my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my characters talk now. That was a big step forward for me. You That's know? a bonus. Characters who talk in a book. <laughs> what a great idea. Actually Kudos say to your daddy. <laughs> So when he reads the first draft and he tells me he kind of, he'll say things like, it gets really good on page 16. I know I need to get out the old red <laughs> pen and take the pages out because daddy's bored. That's such a great way to say, hey, the first 16 pages, not so good, sweetie. <laughs> um, yes, but um the, I can't talk too much about the mystery in the book without giving it away for right. readers, but I was playing with the idea of seeing something that you know you couldn't have seen, and yet you know you saw it, mm -hmm. and that is what happens to Callie. She sees something. She's sure that she saw it, Yeah. but then she has uh, memory loss, and so it comes back to her in flashes. But when she, as she remembers, she's more disturbed because she's like, I, this cannot be, yeah. this could not have happened. Mm -hmm. And I know I didn't dream it. And so it's about her kind of wrestling with that yeah. uh, because yeah. it involves her sister whom she adores. Um, and her sister Emmy doesn't realize what Callie saw. And so okay. they're figuring it out. Okay. Together, because Emmy could have explained it, but she can't because she doesn't know what happened. So right, right. All, you know, it's it's all that. It's okay. their trust in each other, mm -hmm. in some way, getting them through this, but in another way, fueling the yeah. confusion. You know. Absolutely. So I realize that sounds convoluted and, woo -hoo, but anyway. No, yes. I love it. I love it. But you know what? Let's take a let's take a quick break. And then when we come okay. back, I want to ask you about the title and just some questions about letters and things like that. So Okay. All right. We are back here at Madlet Musings <laughs> with Valerie Fraser Lussie. And we are talking about her release, Letters from My Sister. And so far we've been having a lot of fun chit-chatting. I love yes. it. It's it's so exciting. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the title. So the letters from my sister i'm assuming this is written in story form or is it like a is it the word epistolary where you actually read the letters back and forth or yeah it's 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 uh the letters come from a period when the sisters are separated okay about midway through the book um and that is also based on a a family event my grandmother um i don't know i know there are healing springs all over the country i don't think they're just you know, and so there was a resort called Claremont Springs um, in Alabama. And when my grandmother was, I think, 17, she was sent to stay there for okay. a year. And her father took her a dog to keep her company. And he would go uh, take her best friend by train to visit her so she wouldn't get lonely. But all she ever said about it was I had trouble with my nerves, you know, and ev that's all she would say. Uh, and so we all puzzled over that for years and said, why didn't we ask somebody who would have known when they were all still alive? Um, but I took that journey and gave it to Callie, one of the mm -hmm. sisters. And so while she's separated okay. from Emmy, they're corresponding. Okay. And um, it's kind of through the letters that they start figuring out things, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while they're apart right well and sometimes I think it's easier to communicate when you're not face to face about it things is. that you have to be really honest about mm -hmm. or perceptions that you have that yeah. are wrong or right you're not sure um and I'm always kind of one of those people like it's probably better to 
talk it through because you can't misinterpret you know True. inflections and such but at the same time I don't know how many issues I've started to address at least in a letter where it's like let me just get my thoughts out so we have a yeah. starting point yeah it is you're absolutely right it's it's easier um to be very honest with that little bit of distance mm -hmm. um and it's easy to see things you know to understand maybe what you need to say with some distance as opposed mm -hmm. to you know, when you're, yeah, when you're very close. Um, so yeah, I think that that was, that was an important part of it for them to have the distance and yet the trust and they're trying to communicate. And I love setting the book. I've never set a book back this far. It's 1909, 1910. Mostly I do the sixties through the forties, but, um, I wanted that I wanted letter writing. I wanted trains. I wanted horseback. I wanted mm -hmm. buggy. You know, I wanted that life that my grandmother and her sister lived. And I, I didn't want instant communication. You know, we're so right. text, call, whatever, right. um, email. And I didn't want that. I wanted to go back to that time when there wasn't a telephone, you know, and there, you know, you had to sit down and write a letter because going back to the postcards and things I found uh, or my mother and I found um, they're so elegant and they're so um, they're they're personal and warm and yet there's a politeness to them um, that you don't see in a text message you know right, right. yeah there's a certain yeah. dignity to them or something that I really appreciated and yeah, uh, yeah they're they're almost lyrical in a way, yeah. A product. Even if the people weren't necessarily great writers, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a something about sitting down and putting your thoughts out thoughtfully versus mm -hmm. quick tap 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 with your thumbs and send. Uh, <laughs> and you can there's a there's a little bit of history in them too because um, one of the summers that my aunt Effie was at the university um, was during the flu epidemic. Mm -hmm. And um, their baby brother, my great uncle Clyde, apparently was sick. And she's writing in her postcard mm -hmm. to, I can't remember if that one was to their mother or to my grandmother, but she's like, please send word of Clyde. I'll be uneasy until I hear that he's all right. You know, and my grandmother writing her to tell her who had died in the community and who was doing better. And, you know, just such a time when we just take for granted that we're going to get well from most things, right. you know, right. right. Yeah. There are plenty of things we don't get well from, but, um, people don't, it's people don't die as quickly in, yeah. you know, the way that right. they did back then children in childbirth. I mean, my grandmother had nine, my great grandmother had nine children and lost three of them. Wow. One mm -hmm. to some sort of accident when he was a child. And then she had, twin girls that only lived a couple of days. My grandmother lost a son to diphtheria. Mm -hmm. She had another son that caught it and lived, thank goodness. Um, but, you know, we just, we've forgotten how much disease yeah. was around back then. Right, um, right. It was not a given you were going to survive childhood. No, it just, no, it's not. And, you know, it's interesting too, because when you think about even the communication as you're talking about her saying, you know, keep me posted on how he's doing, you know, now the instant, hey, have you heard from so-and-so? Are they doing okay? The text and within, you know, half an hour, maybe worst case scenario, right. by the end of the day, you've got some sort of a health update and you think about sending a letter and it could have been weeks before you got the next exactly. update. And I'm like, I think I would have died of anxiety. That's how I would have died. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I, I mean, forget diphtheria. I would have been dead from just not being able to handle the suspense. <laughs> right. Right. I just didn't, oh. you know, but um, it was just such a different time. And I, I have a few things of my Aunt Effie's. I have a, a, a little brooch that my uncle gave me. I have um, a piece of kind of wine colored velvet from one of her dresses. You know, just, and I have mm. her, her silver dresser set, her um, mirror, her yeah. hand mirror, I have those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just connect with those, you know, it just, I can picture her in the dress made out of that velvet. Mm -hmm. you know? mm, I love that. 
So, um, and I know that she, uh, there's a picture we have of her with her bow. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know anything about their relationship. I don't know how serious they were or anything like that, but I took that little element and gave it to Emmy's character. Okay. And so <laughs> she's very much in love mm -hmm. with, with her fiance and they're planning to get married and, you know, while Callie is still sort of looking yeah. for something that was very hard to find back then, but then she meets a guy from the Midwest um, who's go Midwest. not. Woo! Go Midwest. <laughs> My husband's from Missouri, so I throw oh, the Midwest in there every now and then. Um, <laughs> so they they both want very different kinds of relationships, and they they find them because these are very different men mm -hmm. that they are both attracted to, sure. and so. So, um, so yeah, it's just, it's a lot of relationship and community, but also a mystery that they have to figure out if they're going to be okay, if that makes any sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. And I think, um, you know, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but unfortunately, I think a lot of families have those family mysteries that we're yes. afraid to talk about to get to the root. Exactly. And sometimes that honesty while extremely painful <laughs> can make the situation better. I mean, sometimes it makes it worse too, I suppose, but yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I mean, I grew up in the sixties and seventies and rural Alabama. I mean, we had this huge magna box television that occupied a whole corner of the living room. It had legs, you know, but it only got like three stations <laughs> and, um, and, you know, rotary dial telephone nailed to the wall certainly no internet or texting or anything like that but my my parents and I lived with my grandmother for I don't know I was 11 or 12 before they built a house and then she okay. moved in with us but her house was the gathering spot and mother is the baby of eight children and when my grandmother was alive you know if if she said, I'd like to see you on this weekend, and you didn't check your calendar, you said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All of our children and their boyfriends and girlfriends will be there as well, you know. So, <laughs> without question. <laughs> without question. You didn't, you didn't see if your schedule meshed with hers. And so our house was the gathering place for a huge crowd of family back then, maybe okay. 40 people at one time. And you know, without all this media, storytelling was how we yeah. entertained each other. And um, and I love those stories about it. And they would be talking about the farm and the family and the community and what happened way back when. And and I love those. And I figured out if I would keep my mouth shut and behave and not get on everybody's nerves, I could sit quietly and take it all in. Uh -huh. and um, And they wouldn't pay me one bit of attention. I could hear all of it. Um, and there would be some ghost stories in there, which I know you uh, appreciate. I was going to say, sign me up. <laughs> yes, there would be. Uh, there were stories of a of a ghost choir and their voices drifting down the creek and um, things like that that I just absolutely loved. And so I think that's where all this comes from is just, you know, I think I was born too late because nothing happening now is as interesting to me as what right. happened back then. You know, nothing. Right. So that's probably bad. But um, I just love delving into that, you know, yeah. the family past and old pictures and yeah. uh, stories about the war, the, you know, World War II. My grandmother was getting letters from my uncle and mother said everything would be blacked out except mm -hmm. dear mother loved Beryl because of where he was um yeah. so just things like that are just I don't know why they're just earth shattering to me oh, they just, are yeah they really are so that's where I like to go in stories I like to go yeah. I like to go back a bit sounds great well if people want to get a hold of this book and some of your other novels that you have out there um, where do they where do they find out more about you and your stories? I have a website that is called shockingly ValerieFraserLussy.com. <laughs> um, they can friend me on Facebook. 
just Valerie Frazier Lessie. I have a separate Facebook page for books that I created in the beginning, but I'm I can't keep up with two yeah. Facebook. So just come on over to my friend page. There you go. <laughs> and you can you can find my books uh, in your local Christian bookstores. They're on Amazon, um, wherever books are sold. You know all of the basic online stuff, but I hope they're in your local bookstore too. Yeah, yeah. Well, Valerie, this has been super fun and I'm anxious to read, read the book myself and find out <laughs> some of this family mystery that you won't tell us any more about. Come on. I spoilers. want to commune with your ghost. That's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one of these days you and I can write a Southern ghost story, thought provoking. There you go. Collaboration or something. So <laughs> absolutely. I'm in. <laughs> All right, sign us up. <laughs> uh, well, thanks so much for being on Mad Lip Musings today. I really appreciate your Thank time. You. Come on down to Birmingham sometime, visit me. On my way. <laughs>